Every kid loves space. I mean, how could you not? When you first see images like this, you're suddenly confronted with the grandeur of our home planet. This big blue marble floating through space looks nothing like what we might naively expect Earth to look like. This one picture right here teaches us how our view of the world can be very different from different perspectives. And then you see pictures like this, taken more or less from the furthest point that humans have ever been away from Earth. The Earth looks to the Moon just like the Moon looks to us, waxing and waning over time as the Sun illuminates different parts of the surface. This process of the Moon orbiting the Earth and the Earth orbiting the Sun started long before we were around, and will continue for a long time yet, completely oblivious to the life on Earth's surface. And then you see pictures like this, taken by the Cassini spacecraft in its orbit around Saturn, where our entire lives, literally everyone we know and love, is just there captured within this distant speck from the vantage point of the outer solar system. And we can zoom out even further until eventually we become that pale blue dot, an insignificant pixel in the vastness of space. As a kid, that pale blue dot both scared and excited me. It was humbling to know how little we were on the cosmic scale, and it made me eager to learn about the rest of the universe and what was in it, from its exotic exoplanets to its mind-bending black holes. But as I grew older, my childlike fascination with space slowly dwindled. Space was still interesting, sure, but it didn't really excite me like it once did. I was born too late to experience the space fever of the Apollo missions, and I was born far too early to witness us colonise other planets and venture out into the cosmos. Or so I thought. But then I saw this. For me, there's something so mesmerising and futuristic about watching these two rocket boosters land autonomously, simultaneously, after being on the edge of space just minutes before. When I watch that video, I feel awe, fascination, but also hope. This photo right here summarises what is possible when humans come together and decide that they do want to go to space. For centuries now, we've had a distant dream of being able to venture to the stars at light speed and forge a galactic empire. The small step that Neil Armstrong took 50 years ago on the surface of the moon was meant to be that giant leap which propelled us into the future of space exploration. NASA even had a plan to land people on Mars in the 1980s, but obviously that never came to be. Then the space shuttle was meant to dramatically bring down the cost of space travel and inspire the post-Apollo generation, but huge expenses and the two fatal disasters of Challenger in 1986 and Columbia in 2003 meant that the support for the space programme declined. There's also the start-stop culture at organisations such as NASA. NASA is a government agency, and as such, there's been a distinctive cycle over the last few decades of one president setting up an initiative and a goal for NASA to work towards, only for the next president to scrap that goal and establish a new aim instead. This politics is exactly why astronauts never made it to Mars in the 1980s, and why there seems to be a new objective for NASA every few years. So, why be optimistic? Why am I so confident that we're now living through a space revolution? and that by the end of this century, we'll not only have set foot on Mars, but have accomplished so much more, some things which are probably unthinkable to us now. Well, the answer is one word, competition. Everyone knows that what predominantly drove the space race in the 50s and 60s was Cold War competition between the Soviet Union and the United States. Once the moon had been reached, there was much less incentive for governments to invest in long-term goals for space exploration. But we live in a new age of competition, not only between nations, but also between companies. The privatisation of space means that companies are competing with each other to drive down the cost of getting to space, as well as rethinking the best way to do it. A government has a lot of things to worry about and a lot of priorities to take care of, whereas a company can be a lot more focused. Some may solely focus on optimising getting satellites into low, low Earth orbits, for example, whereas others may do that as a stepping stone to ultimately get to Mars. When one person or several people take leadership of a company for a sustained period of time, that can drive forward progress towards a specific goal. 
Now, it's important to remember that space isn't about to become entirely private. Governments can and will still have an important role to play, as demonstrated by the recent missions to Mars from the US, UAE and China. Space exploration is becoming more and more of an international enterprise, and governments will be at the heart of that, not least to figure out the grey area of the law in space. But we have now reached a point where it's the healthy competition between companies which is driving innovation and progress in space exploration towards the future. But what is that future? Well, that's kind of the beauty of competition. There is no linear path the future ought to take. We live in a time where different companies and agencies have different views of what that future should be. The result is that a lot of people are working simultaneously on different projects, and the space sector is steadily growing as more and more people join in. For some, the key project for the future is establishing a permanent base on the moon. NASA's Artemis program, named after the twin sister of Apollo, is a mission which aims to get the first woman and next man on the moon by 2024. It's a great example of the international cooperation that space exploration can generate, with NASA partnering up with organisations from Canada to Europe to Japan. The secondary aim of the programme, which is to establish a long-term presence on the moon by the end of this decade, would give NASA crucial information and experience before their eventual human trip to Mars by the end of the 2030s. And whilst NASA is obviously a government agency, they're also collaborating with commercial companies to actively encourage this private competition and speed up development. The Artemis programme will include a base camp at the Lunar South Pole, which would initially house astronauts for weeks at a time, as well as the Gateway an outpost orbiting the moon, which astronauts will dock to first before landing on the lunar surface. Now, a lot of people have the goal of getting to Mars, but in terms of how best to do that, well, there are two main schools of thought. Some think we should be putting all our efforts into getting to Mars now, and that we'll learn the necessary lessons along the way. Others believe in a moon-first, Mars-later approach, where establishing a moon base is a vital first step in the process of getting to the red planet. NASA clearly believes in the second option, and it does have quite a few benefits. The Moon is a perfect stop-off point for travel from Earth to both the inner and outer solar system. It's small, so it has a low surface gravity. That, and the lack of atmosphere, means that it's both easier and cheaper to launch rockets from the Moon than the Earth. The recent confirmation of liquid water on the surface means that there's the potential of manufacturing rocket fuel from that water, making the Moon a possible refuelling station and further reducing the cost of space travel, especially to Mars. And by first establishing a Moon base, scientists can further understand how the human body copes in low gravity for long periods of time before sending people to Mars. Plus, any astronauts in an emergency have a much higher chance of potentially being rescued by someone on Earth than if they were on Mars, a lot, lot further away. For others, the key project for the future is asteroid mining. There are multiple companies and startups out there dedicated to researching and engineering the technology needed to go out and extract valuable resources from asteroids, and this is definitely a worthy goal to have. Now, asteroids may look like boring lumps of rock, but they come in different types, with some full of metals like nickel iron, platinum and gold. On Earth, the majority of heavy heavy elements like these sunk towards the core during the planet's formation, and the small fragments which we managed to mine on the surface were most likely deposited there by asteroids themselves, crashing into the planet millions or billions of years ago. A typical metallic asteroid can may contain trillions of dollars worth of precious metals, and there are estimated to be between 1 and 2 million asteroids in the asteroid belt alone. Not only would it be possible to export these materials back to Earth, but materials such as iron could be mined in space and used in space for further construction projects. When building infrastructure on the moon, for example, it would probably be cheaper to send iron from the asteroid belt over the millions of miles it takes to get to the moon than it would be to mine the iron on Earth and send it up into space, since launching stuff from Earth is still so expensive. And although the gold-filled asteroids steal the headlines, it's the asteroids which contain water that are likely to be the main focus in the near future, since water is the most important substance in space. Not only is it useful as drinking water, but it can also be used to shield us from radiation or even make rocket fuel. Just like the moon, the prospect of using asteroids as refueling stops would further reduce the cost of space travel. Now, there are multiple ideas out there of how to actually go about mining asteroids, including harpoons, magnetic rakes, and even optical mining, where concentrated sunlight essentially vaporises the asteroid's surface. 
But the key thing to take away is that multiple companies are working on multiple approaches. And in terms of time scale, it's quite likely that within 10 years, mining vehicles will have gone out to asteroids and brought back a significant amount of resources. Now, for others, obviously, the key project for the future is building a permanent base on Mars. SpaceX, for example, aims to launch their first unmanned mission to Mars in 2024, with their first manned mission to lift off a couple of years later, whilst NASA, with its Moon First, Mars Later strategy, is targeting the late 2030s for human footprints on the Red Planet. In any case, it's certainly not unfeasible for humans to set foot on Mars by the end of this decade, and getting there by 2050, for example, is a very attainable goal. Now, the idea of getting to Mars certainly captures the imagination the most. We've already been to the moon, but the idea of humanity forging a new Martian civilization is something which has been dreamt about for a long time. But going to Mars is clearly the most ambitious of these near-future space projects. Travelling there is nothing like going to the moon, and there are a load of challenges to overcome. First off, Mars is roughly 600 times further away than the moon. The three-day trip to the moon is nothing compared to the six-month expedition it takes to reach Mars. Now, one of the main threats during the journey to Mars would be the harmful radiation from the, from the sun in the form of gamma rays, x-rays and UV light, for example. On Earth, we're protected from this by two main things, our magnetic field and our atmosphere. But obviously, out in the vacuum of space, neither of those things are there to protect us. Now, it would be possible to protect astronauts during the journey by placing water tanks in the walls of the spacecraft, which would, which would absorb most of this radiation. But Mars itself has no magnetic field, and its atmosphere is very thin, about 100 times thinner than Earth's. To protect yourself from radiation on the Martian surface, you need to make sure your habitats are either underground or under lots of layers of dirt. The fact that Mars is so far away means that solar power is only about 40% as effective as it is here, which is obviously impractical for powering a settlement. This means that it's likely that the first few habitats will be fuelled by nuclear power. Mars's distance from Earth also means that a phone call would be impossible. It would take anywhere between 3 and 22 minutes for someone on Mars to hear what someone on Earth was saying. It's important to remember that when we talk about astronomical distances, the speed of light is actually pretty slow. I've already mentioned the thin atmosphere, and this also poses problems when landing on Mars. Atmospheric drag is really important for slowing spacecraft down before landing, but this effect on Mars is a lot less powerful, so any attempt at landing on the surface has to be thought through carefully. This is why SpaceX, for example, are considering a belly flop approach, which maximises the effect of atmospheric drag and slows the spacecraft down as much as possible before it engages retro rockets to slow itself down even further and ultimately land safely. There's also the issue of growing food in space, as well as dealing with the low-gravity environment and its effects on the human body. But scientists on the International Space Station have been hard at work on both of these issues. Plants have, plants have been successfully harvested and eaten by crew on the ISS, and we continue to learn more every day about how they behave in microgravity. There's also research ongoing into aquaponics, which combines raising fish in tanks with growing plants in water without soil, and this will likely be the primary way of feeding Martian astronauts. The way humans react to spending prolonged periods of time outside of Earth's gravity is still being understood, but this month marks 20 years of a continual human presence in the space station, and we have learned a lot of lessons in that time about how to keep humans safe in space. And it's important to point out these numerous challenges facing an expedition to Mars, because it's easy to dream of terraforming Mars tomorrow and making it a second home planet. Whilst that won't happen for a very long time, these challenges facing us now are surmountable, with more and more people dedicating their lives to tackling them. So what is the future of space exploration? Well, it's all of these projects, and more, which are being taken on simultaneously by more and more people every day. Whilst it's hard to predict which of these will come to fruition first and foresee all of the potential problems along the way, the fact that the space fever is growing and more and more people are joining the new space race accelerates our progress even more. It creates a positive feedback loop. The more successes we have, the more attention the space sector generates and the more inspiration there is for the next generation. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of YouTube channels, podcasts, documentaries, books and movies examining the future of space travel and what challenges this new chapter in human history will bring. Every day, more people are realising that the new space age really has already begun. Now, I'm sure there are some of you who are still sceptical about the realities of any of these projects happening anytime soon. 
After all, futurists are keen to jump onto the bandwagon and get excitement going. But in reality, there are plenty of unresolved issues standing between us and these goals. And some still sound like they belong in the realm of science fiction. But after watching videos such as SpaceX's successful test flight of the Falcon Heavy, after seeing what a collective human effort is capable of achieving in such a short space of time, a spark of childlike awe ignites in me for the first time in years. And I'm not the only one. Kids are being inspired by recent missions to learn about science, understand our place in the cosmos, and to dream big. There are people who spend their lives working towards the dream of the future in space, and because of their efforts, that future is approaching us at an ever greater rate. The space revolution has already begun, and it will only accelerate as time goes on. People will look back on this time as the birth of a new era of humans in space. Be grateful for the opportunity to be alive right now, the most exciting time in human history, as we dare to go where no humans have gone before. Thank you.